Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Dovekit Studios and to the second in our Twilight Talk series uh, on design. The second, I say, from this series, which has emerged from our linen stories. I'm crouching into the microphone because this is going to be recorded, which reminds me to ask everyone if you would rather not be appearing on our video recording, then please let us know uh, towards the end of the show. Design in a sustainable Scotland. So we're here at a point when Venice is suffering. Sydney is facing a smog and running out of water to put out the bushfires. On the positive side, India has decided this year to, instead of going with 13 coal-fired power stations, use solar field energy. Great news. Glen Rothes, a bit closer to home, is now supplied by a biomass. A 10% of its energy comes from a bio, biomass power supply. Very good news and very progressive. Tonight, we're going to have a think about those positive moves towards a sustainable Scotland with design in mind. I'm thrilled with the speakers and I'm going to uh, introduce our panel in a minute. But before that, some words from someone who I respect enormously, and she'll not thank me for stalling here, but Celia Joycey has brought to Edinburgh and to the Dovecot a real energy, and it's beyond a tapestry studio, it's now a design hub, and I'd recommend keeping an eye out for all their events. Uh, fantastic mix of folk, and it's great to be here. Thanks, Celia. So in terms of energy, we've brought John Ennis and our linen stories to, um, to Dovecot, so that is enough energy, I think, because we're all very inspired by linen. Um, I'm here to welcome you to Dovecot Studios to say thank you to John Ennis and thank you to Journeys in Design, thank you to the speakers um, for bringing all of your ideas here tonight because we're all here to learn. Um, I have to ask you to make your phones that little bit more sustainable by turning them onto low battery or certainly not having the ringtone on. Um, if in the event that there would be a fire here, the alarm would ring and we would all exit um, through this door where the bathrooms are also located should you need them. Um, but welcome. You, did you mention your, your, your events this Saturday? John's got um, uh, a, uh, an event here on Saturday and then followed by a walking tour around the city, so you're welcome to come back again on Saturday and bring all of your ideas and, and knowledge and learning and networking. So enjoy this evening and um, thank you. I'm going to have to crack on. It's great to see some familiar faces in the audience. It's lovely that you've come to support the event and also, as Celia is saying, hopefully generate a little bit of debate. I'm handing over to someone who I'm very privileged to have met more recently. Robin Harper was the first Green MSP Member of Parliament and is a lifelong uh, activist for sustainability in Scotland and I'm delighted Robin's here to say a few words. Oh, first, thank you very much, John, for inviting me to uh, come along this evening just to say a few words to start this all off. Um, when I first started in politics, um, I used to liken it to the flee on an elephant's backside. If it bit hard enough, the elephant might change direction. <laughs> um, and that, that flea, of course, has grown into a worldwide movement of, of, of green politics uh, throughout Europe and throughout the rest of the world um, in, the, in the last 20 years. Um, Mao Zedong said <clears throat> that you can move a mountain as long as you have enough people and enough teaspoons. Um, and that was just to accentuate how important it is for people to realize it's their own personal contribution to what's happening that is the most important thing. It doesn't matter how small the project or how big it is. It's loads and loads and loads of relatively small projects that are going to change the world if we have enough of them. The, the problems that John mentioned, if I could uh, put them in, in 
the, the context that I like to put, to, to, to put them now, because it's far worse than I ever imagined. People used to call me a theatre 20 years ago, you know. My goodness, I would have been terrified if I'd realised how bad things were going to be by now. Um, but plastic pollution in our seas, it's not the, so much the big stuff that's strangling the whales and the dolphins, although that's bad. It's the fact that these microbeads that people brush their teeth with are also polluting the, the, the seas and attacking the very small creatures that live in the surface of the sea, the phytoplankton and the green plankton. If those die off, first of all, they're a carbon sink, but secondly, they're the bottom of the uh, food chain. If they go, the whole chain is undermined. So we really have to think how these very small things, how dangerous they are, as well as the big things. What excites me about this project and the, the other projects that are, uh, that, that are beginning to come uh, with materials that people use in their daily lives and particularly for the clothes that you wear and for making that lovely coracle at the back um, is that these are things that are within our power. We can say we want to buy clothes made out of flax. We can say that we want to insulate our houses with sisal uh, and not with the stuff that burns up and uh, kills people in high flats. Um, we have the power. And the fashion houses themselves are, on the surface, look as if they're getting the message that they like us to believe. There's nobody from the fashion houses. They're here, a big one. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, about 85% of the trade-offs that they uh, set up as, by way of apology for the, uh, the, uh, the, the effects that, the, uh, that uh, their commercial enterprises have on the environment, um, about 85% of them probably don't work. In other words, they get them started and then go away and uh, nobody get, hears about them anymore. Anyway, <clears throat> this is exciting. It's good stuff and it deserves your support. And I've got my notebook with me and I'm going to be taking lots of notes. So now I hand over back to you, John. Thank you. Fantastic speakers tonight. The attempt for tonight is, as all of Journeys in Design, to try and link across art, design, and industry. It's an important reality that each contributes to the other in, in wonderfully exciting ways. And when it works, it works wonderfully well. And I think in this area of sustainability, through our linen stories and other exhibitions, we're showing that. What a privilege. Uh, Marnie Collins, uh, associate professor at Heriot-Watt University. And um, Lynn Wilson. Uh, I don't, I hope she doesn't mind me saying, Doyen of the Circular Economy in Scotland. Trish Belford is over from Belfast to talk about material innovation. And John Ferguson, a social entrepreneur who's developed uh, wonderful new materials, and I see some samples to the left here uh, related to uh, the construction industry. 40%, 40% of landfill in Scotland comes from the construction industry. We need to do something better, and we've got some great ideas coming up from the panel. I'd like to introduce Lynn Wilson. Thanks so much for inviting me to, to talk tonight. It's always really exciting to get to talk about the circular economy. Um, and so I'll just start by telling you a little bit about myself. Uh, I have a small consultancy practice called uh, Lynn I. Wilson. The I is for uh, I am the consumer I'm trying to change. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. It's also my middle name, Isabel, for my gran Isabella, who was a huge influence in my life and my passion for the circular economy. So at the moment, uh, I trained as a textile designer and constructed textiles, specialising in knit. I went to Duncan of Jordanston and Nottingham Trent, spent a lot of years as a lecturer. But in the last eight years, I've spent uh, time in the circular economy, and that started off my role in planning aid for Scotland when I worked on the um, zero waste strategy and planning then moving on to Zero Waste Scotland, where I worked in the circular economy team and the engagement strategy leading up to the Making Things Last uh, launch in 2016. Uh, since then, I've 
I held a Winston Churchill Fellowship. I went to Japan for a month to engage with uh, Japan, who are leaders in circular economy policy. I talked to textile designers, to industry, to academia. And then I set up a little, um, I'm in the process of setting up a social enterprise called Circular Economy Wardrobe, uh, because I really see the need to engage with low-income consumers, to really engage people in how it's going to benefit their household budget. And that's because at the moment I'm doing a PhD at Glasgow University. As a designer, I realised that the key thing that's always left out in design is the consumer. We're always designing for people, not with people. And so I decided to take a, a leap out of design for a while and focus on social science. And um, I hadn't really thought about this, but I am looking for 30 households in Edinburgh to work with me on my field work. So if anybody's interested, do see me later. I'll tell you all about it. It's called uh, Closing the Loop, Driving Circularity in uh, Consumer Clothing Disposal. And I'm trying to understand not why we dispose of so much clothing, yes, why, but also how. How do we make those decisions? And all of the work that I do, I underpin it under the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Scotland committed to the UN Sustainable Development Goals in 2015, and my work practice sits under Sustainable Development Goal 12, Responsible Consumption and Production. And so I feed in everything I'm doing, like tonight, uh, I feed all of the um, information into the UN, into a reporting structure through Consumers International, to demonstrate that we're really working towards achieving these goals. In this time of really uncertain political structures, the UN goals are there to guide us to where we need to get to. So... This year, it's 100 years of the Bauhaus. And when I was at art school, it was the Bauhaus <coughs> practice that you were trained in. And I think it's really important to reflect on this. And I love this quote from Walter Gropius. Our guiding principle was that design, design is neither intellectual nor a material affair, but sim simply an integral, stuff, an integral part of the stuff of life, necessary for everyone in a civilised society. But it also reminds me that the Chief Operating Officer of IKEA said in 2016, we cannot sell anybody any more stuff. We can't design any more stuff. We've reached peak stuff in terms of unique household products that we can sell people. We need to rethink this model. And when I think about the stuff of life and I think about how much stuff we have, this is the challenge. And how have we got here? So at the moment, we're trained as linear designers. We're trained to think about design in a linear way. It's about designing as best we can to solve a problem, but we're not really worried about the end. So then as consumers, at the end, we don't know what to do with it. So it ends up somewhere, maybe in the bin. But as consumers, we're also quite uh, disruptive. So it's not necessarily all bad, it's not necessarily all linear. We have different ways before we dispose. We can pass something on, we can gift it, we can sell it, or we might just keep it for later and some of us might end up as big hoarders. But that's before it ends up in the bin. But it will absolutely, definitely end up in the bin because it hasn't been designed not to. And one of my pet hates, and I've this probably won't earn me many fans in the room, but I get really frustrated with Scotland's sustainability branding. We keep producing the most stunning, beautiful textiles, products, well-designed, badging them as sustainable, but we're happy to export them anywhere else in the world and not worry about what's going to happen to them. And one day, just like Rana Plaza, when we saw all those labels in landfill and they said all those brands, we're going to see on telly, handmade in Scotland, produced in Scotland, made in Scotland, because we didn't take care of the end. And so, how do we do this? So circular design is all about how we do that, how we really, as designers, take responsibility, and as consumers, as designers, we help consumers take responsibility. And we're all consumers, as well as designers, or... Um, lovers of design, ultimately we are consumers. 
And so circular design, for me, equals responsible design. And what does that look like? So the first thing as a designer, it's who are you designing for? Because I know, particularly with clothing, nobody's designing for me. I'm five foot two. And most things are designed for someone who's at least five seven. So I've got quite a bit to lob off there, pull it up with a belt, or just think, okay, if I put some heavy shoes on, maybe we'll get the balance. So it's about, even as I stopped designing about nine years ago because I was an accessory designer and I thought, nobody else needs another scarf or a pair of gloves for me. The world is swarming in other stunning designers. So what I'm really interested in is how we take our huge design capital and address the real issues, the real, how do we get those systems going so that we can design those stunning garments or those stunning products or that phenomenal furniture, but at the end of life, we know who is responsible for that. And it's not just past the parcel. And as designers, in order to do that, we need to understand how is the carer, how is the custodian, when we sell something, how is that custodian going to look after or their, the product that we have beautifully designed? Do we know how they're going to care for it? Do we know if it's repairable? Do we know if they can repair it or are they going to take it to someone else? Do we know how they're going to clean it? Do we actually know as designers if our product is dry cleanable or cleaning? Or how would you clean it? Or can you hang it up? Will it self-clean? Have we thought about that? Have we thought about that at the fibre or the raw material stage? Have we really thought from every angle how it's going to perform? And then the access disposal. When I say access disposal, that's back to it might be chucked in the bin or it might be accessed by someone else. So is our design robust? Is it robust enough to cope with multiple consumers? How many times does our product go in a cycle? Again, have we thought about that at the fibre at the, pro, at the fiber level, at the material level, at the design level? Is it designed for disassembly? What about the parts that wear more than other parts? Have we thought about that? Because ultimately, have we thought about the recycling, reusability of our product? Can it be upcycled? So when those parts wear out, can we repair it? Again, do we have those skills? Do we know our clients have those skills to repair it? Or can it be downcycled? which uh, we're going to listen to some examples of downcycling tonight, so I won't talk about that too much. But ultimately, we want that closed loop. We want uh, those products, and we know that the easiest closed loop is petrochemical, and it's not the most attractive fibre in the room, it's not the most attractive <coughs> liquid, we're trying to get rid of it. But what would happen if they turned the taps off? How many of us could actually make our own product? I might be full of a room of designers, I'm not sure. But even if you design one thing, perhaps you can't make everything. So we have to think about that 65% of clothing and 65% of product and the plastics in the ocean that we have at the moment, when we can't just turn off the tap, how can we create those closed loops and how can we work with those materials? But what we really need to understand is the cycles that we work within. So we talk about slow consumption, we talk about slow design, but not everything in our life is slow. So we need to understand what we need for 30 seconds, what we need for 30 minutes, and what we need for 30 years, and not make assumptions that it's all about slow or it's all about fast. I recently gave a TED talk in uh, Bath, which was uh, very nice, almost as nerve-wracking as it is tonight. Uh, and I just want to give you an example from that talk about what I mean by that. And I started off by saying my grandmother was my biggest circular economy inspiration. And in my TED talk, I'm talking about everybody knitted when I was a wee girl. My mum could knit, my grand could knit, everybody knitted. And they knitted these stunning Aran jumpers. But if they knitted for them for me as a wee person, they were made out of acrylic and they were really scratchy, itchy. But they would always be knitting the same craft in beautiful iron for special occasions or for that long-term jumper. But the thing about whether it was made from a stunning iron natural wool fibre or acrylic, the craftsmanship was the same. 
And it was deconstructed in such a way that when you thought you'd grown out of one and you were like, thank goodness for that, <laughs> the unraveled two, <laughs> you were standing there, unraveling two and turning it into one big one and shoving it over your head. Sometimes it didn't get the sizing quite right. But this, for me, is a true closed loop. And that true closed loop relies not just on materials but on skill. And to give you an example of that, in 1984 there were 2,000 hand knitters, Shetland and Aran knitters, on the island of Shetland. We'll be very lucky today if there are 200. Because in that period the oil industry came and it brought a whole new industry and a whole new economy. Which for Scotland was, and for Shetland was fantastic, but that means we lost a whole generation of skill. And we're not going to get that back. So what's next to go? We have to think about how is our world evolving and changing and how can we hack that basically? How can we ensure that we still have the skills that we need when the lights go off? And just to give you an example of what it means, because in terms of economy, because people ask me all the time, but where is the economy and the circular economy if we're going to cycle everything all the time? I just want to give you an example of Scotland is leading on sustainable procurement. And what that means is if you think about the amount of times that you're frustrated with your council, with the NHS, where you see the waste that your taxes are going to, and you're thinking, this is ridiculous, my waste management system doesn't work for me, nothing is working for me, this isn't fair. And that's about sustainable procurement. How do we get our public services to procure services more sustainably. And this is a company from Glenroth is called Keela. And what Keela do is they manufacture um, uh, for the military, for security wear, for protective clothing. And they were one of the first members of something I led on in Scotland called the Sustainable Clothing Action Plan. And that's about um, industry reducing their carbon, water and waste by 2020. And they were looking for something to really demonstrate the sustainability credentials because when they were tendering for contracts, they were losing those contracts because they couldn't demonstrate what was going to happen to that product at the end of life. So they might be producing for the military in Italy or police services in France, but they really needed to know, those um, procurers really needed to know what was going to happen at the end of life. And this is really important. This is the step forward in terms of transparency and accountability at the end of life for products. So that was just a small example and it was a bit kind of left field but I thought it was really important to look at a, a key employer in Fife and to look at how they're addressing sustainability and the circular economy. Thank you very much. Trish Belfort, um, I'm going to welcome to the stage from Belfast. Thanks very much, Trish. Okay, good evening. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, the second time I've been to Edinburgh, but so far it looks beautiful and I'll certainly be back. I'm going to talk to you tonight about one specific um, project that I've been working on uh, with an architect and it's in collaboration with MYB Textiles, who are a fabulous uh, Damas Weaving Company in Ayrshire. But um, Ruth Morrow and I have both been uh, working together since 2005. I uh, returned to Ireland in 2004. I had a printing business in Macclesfield, so I had spent most of my life printing for the fashion industry. I had a sort of a bit of a midlife crisis, I think, and I ended up going back home and ended up staying there. Ruth had also come back to Northern Ireland and was practicing architecture. So we just got together and the, we started to play. And this is the, an example of the piece of work that's in the exhibition, but I want to show you how we sort of got to this point. We started in 2006 and we started off calling ourselves Girly Concrete. It was a really flippant name. We were mixing concrete and these guys walked in and said, what are you doing? And we said, Girly Concrete, what's it look like? That stuck for ages. Um, uh, we had to change it laterally to tactility factory, we sort of had to grow up. Architects just could not write girly concrete on their specifications. <laughs> um, but we just started off with a lot of fun and working together and we wanted to bring two of Northern Ireland's indigenous industries together, textiles and construction. And Ruth was 
really interested in the work that I was doing, which was um, textiles and printed textiles. And she, her view was she wanted to bring a sense of humanity into a building, so something that you could touch and something that you could engage with. So we started to experiment, sort of just being a bit messing around. And we very first test that we did, we were putting lace into concrete. This was pre-bought lace. And what's interesting now is we've actually gone full circle to where we are now. And hence, that's why the project's been called Back to Source. But what we really wanted to do and how we worked together was, my background was textiles, as I've said, and everything was processed there. As a school, I actually wanted to do chemistry and um, art, but you couldn't really do it then. So it was always just about experimenting with fabrics, materials and fibres. And as I said, I worked in the fashion industry. So I'd done a lot of the debore, which is like a burning out process. And this was a particular um, dress that I did for Helen's story in 1994. But I'm always very keen to reuse processes, to rethink about them. And so it's, it's, it's the same technical process, but different materials that we started to put into the concrete. And I'm not talking about the velvet concrete tonight, but it is um, <coughs> probably the one that we use the most, and it's very tactile, very soft. We call these little strokies, and I used to take them to friends of mine in hospital when they were sick, because they're really lovely. So because there's sort of that real sense of tactility, which Ruth really wanted to bring back in to a hard surface. So we talk about making hard surfaces soft. So this particular project has been 10 years. In 2007, we applied for funding to look at what... Was it really stupid to put textiles in concrete? Because it is a pretty stupid thing to do. Textiles are very delicate. Concrete's alkaline and it's not a very nice material. So we did a whole project working out to see if textiles could survive. The results came back were fantastic. All the tests that we did Linen was the fabric and the, the yarn Yay. that had the most, <laughs> you know, it was the one that was saying, yeah, it will survive in alkaline. So, this was what we did in 2007. So, we wove linen, we did lino weaves, we had to put the bit in the back, is we have to, it's a bit of, we call it a gripper, it's, it's in underneath at the back. So it stops the fabric coming away, so it's all completely subsumed. By doing that, by using textiles in a sort of a clever way, we're actually having to use less cement as well. And we were working with great guys who actually developed the recipes for us. But technically it was successful, but it looked awful. Mm -hmm. Aesthetically, it was absolutely ghastly. So there was an interest in linen and concrete. So in order to solve that initially, we got into using loom state linen, horrendous amount of processes. We had to laser cut, bond, glue, everything. It was just loads and loads of processes. But people actually um, really, they did like it. And it was, very, it was successful. And something that I hadn't considered being as a textile designer, the alchemy in the mix of the loom state linen shrinking and the water in the concrete caused this really lovely um, sort of undulated, this, this 3D form. And within the, within the mould making of concrete, the textiles were being really clever here because every time you wanted to change a pattern, you'd have to make a new mould, whereas all we needed to do was change the textile pattern. And by the reaction of the water with the linen, we were getting this lovely shrinking effect. So th this was a popular process, but as I said, it was massively, um, oh, you know, there were so many processes in it, so much energy used, and um, so we had to really start to think about different ways of using it. With everything, this was probably the first project that we did, and with a lot of things, we this was one of the most pleasurable, because I think we sort of, I think I had my second midlife textile crisis probably about a year ago, which I'll come to in a minute. This was a lovely piece of work for the new Derry, London Derry, whatever they call it, Playhouse. And we were invited to do a concrete freeze in the entrance hall. And working with an architect was great because she wanted to do curves and bends and folds so that it sort of caught the light. That would completely freak me out because I would tend to work with something flat. 
Um, but when you work with somebody who's from a completely different environment from you, or they understand new mode making, push this in different ways. Um, we used the um, elements from the old playhouse that was all being knocked down, because I'm also very interested in heritage, and we used these elements from the fan lights and the tiles to actually make the pattern that became the, the wall. Now that's still there, and the nice thing about this particular product, believe it or not, the older it gets, the, actually the more beautiful it becomes. It's sort of, when we take them out of the mould and they're, they're just formed and just poured, they, they, they never look very nice, but the older they get, so that's still there, and it's still actually looking lovely. So, even if I say it myself, because I'm just coming on to a complete dog's breakfast of a job that we did that was awful. So, there's so much more to this technology than meets the eye, which is where, you know, that's how the three of the processes have been able to be patented, which is something that, you know, universities absolutely love. Personally, I'm not that bothered about that, you know, we just, we just push, keep pushing the boundaries. So there's, everything that you don't see is as important as you do see, and it's a bit like lace, the voids are as important as the pattern. So that you can see there, there's so much gluing, bonding, cutting, and this was my last crisis. The company, we formed Tactility Factory, we grew up from Girly Concrete. Investors got interested in us. We thought this is amazing, fantastic. Um, they invested in us, but we quickly realized that actually, they weren't really interested in us. They just saw something and thought, you know, this is great, and put a very, very highly paid sort of CEO into this, which I, I just wish I'd just said, look, I can't stand this, and this isn't working for me, and walk, we sort of kept going. He went off to Abu Dhabi and sold this monstrosity of a job, and came back and said, got this job, and I said, well, what, what's this all about? You know, we've got laser cutting, we've got digital printing, we've got everything going on there, and they want it in like 10 weeks, which is ridiculous. Ruth and I had crafted our process all the way through, and we didn't actually do this job. We did it with <coughs> enormous panels. We had no connection with the people that we were doing it for, so there was no sense of craftsmanship or anything. So after this, we actually, um, we did close the company down. We just, we, we, we just closed it because really, it just wasn't right. It wasn't working on both sides or both halves. So in 2017, we decided to go back and look at those original experiments. And we wanted to go right back to the beginning. And I had always been a massive fan of NYB Textiles. They're an amazing company. So we visited them and started talking about textile development with them. And they are the only unique industrial producer of wool and lace, and they're renowned for tradition and innovation, which is what really appealed to me. There was no, oh, we can't do that, or whatever. It was all like, you know, this is possible, that's possible. Because I came from a sort of a design manufacturing background. We spoke the same language, and I wanted to force them to do stuff that they couldn't do just because I wanted to design like that. And so we started experimenting again, it was great, we were back just experimenting hands-on with all their laces, because we needed to find what the right point settings were, that the concrete could flow, because we do have a special mix, it's not just a normal mix, it's a much lighter mix, it's a very thin mix so that we use less. So we had to do an awful lot of experimentation and they were brilliant, we went backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards with different ideas. And then it came to thinking about, well, what's the design going to be? And I had been working on a project which, um, there were 1,600 of these were um, going to be thrown in the skip. They came from William Little, Damask Weaving Company. And that was one of the designs that was in there. So it's sort of like using what's already there and bringing it into a different use. There actually is a book that's been produced about the whole of the Northern Irish Damask linen industry. And so this was the design, twist, and we started to work with NYB, wanted to get movement into it, so there was um, dense areas of density, 
and areas where we could let the concrete flow through more or, or not. And there are loads and loads and loads of different ideas and designs. Because the thing with concrete, when you've got it in squares, it never flowed. Like if you put a wallpaper up, you match it and it flows. But we found these. So this was about making a design with NYB, because we had to get it to fit their loom settings, that we could turn it um, you know, every direction, and it could still flow, and it could still work, and it sort of had a lovely rhythm to it through their different weave densities. What was lovely, everything, the designs were done using their traditional card cutting to create the weave pattern. And so we had quite a few visits to the factory, and we had to work within their loom restrictions and their width restrictions. And then this is twist on the loom. Margot was wonderful, she always used to send us lots of lovely photographs. And then she had no idea what these were going to be like. And we would get the fabric and we knew that it was going to be completely different once we had put it in the concrete. And this was it at the Linen Biennale last year in Lisbon. And that's the city sort of sitting on the floor. So you can see how it works and it weaves and it flows. And it worked very nicely. So that is me. So thank you very much, John. <laughs> Say there point out three people in the audience. Margo is here. Margo, can you stand up? MYB Textiles in Irvin, fantastic. A really a, a, a proper pioneering uh, place. I mean, these uh, industry doing small scale batch design with, design with designers and experimental. It's not common. So uh, MYB Textiles is fantastic. And this is bound to make me give me a cue to speak about concrete designs to thrive. So we're moving on from our linen stories and launching. In June next year, our next Material World production, all about concrete. And I'm going to point out Florentina Absenstein and Joanna Kessel. Please stand up. Two wonderful artists working in Edinburgh who are going to be in our concrete series, both working with concrete. Um, the other thing, so I mean, the joys and challenges of collaboration, uh, it's what it's all about. And sometimes it, you, you roll with people who roll with you and you just have to let go of the rest. And that's how it goes. And I think anyone in the design world that I've been fortunate enough to speak to has, has spoken to that very, very clearly. And um, I'm bound to mention Girly Concrete and Walter Gropius. That Lynn has said, Gropius is supposed to have said women are good for weaving and growing vegetables. Well, good for them. <laughs> uh, they actually had it right. Uh, I, that's, I had the joy of weaving for the first time down in Devon with some linen uh, two weeks ago. And it, it was an absolute pleasure. And we have our wild weaving um, workshops. And I'd like to say hello to Jenny Bruce from Art of Science Library. Jenny, to, to stand up for us. Jenny, uh, um, I'm going to say hello to a couple other people next time, but uh, without further ado, you have to keep me quiet. Marnie Collins from Heriot Walt University. Marnie. Thank you so much for inviting me tonight. And it's such a pleasure to be here. Can you hear me okay? Yeah? Right. So, um, a little bit about my design journey first. Um, you might be able to tell, but my accent is not Scottish originally. I'm from Philadelphia, and I came to Scotland um, in the 80s originally from Philadelphia as an exchange student at the College of Textiles, which is now, of course, Harriet Watt University. I fell in love with Scotland, very good to do, and um, I ended up working in New York for a couple of years, but then moving here, and have been here for more than 30 years. Um, I started up uh, a hand painting wallpaper business with my husband, which was environmentally friendly, and we had been running that for 30 years. Um, just recently, just uh, stopped that business because we were getting a little bit too old to paint, I think. Um, but uh, in the meantime, I had um, been fortunate enough to work at Harry Watt University as a lecturer in weave design, so I'm an associate professor there, and I have a real passion for nurturing talent and um, also for linking with industry and working particularly with industry which uh, nurtures partisanship, heritage, and provenance. So unlike my fellow panelists this evening, um, I'm going to tell you a story, and it's not necessarily my own practice. Um, I think it's a success story in sustainability. So, okay, um, there's a strong relationship uh, between Scottish products and their environment. And this can be seen really clearly from the color palette taken 
from the Harris Street beaches, and then the communal spirit of the workforce that happens throughout the Outer Hebrides. The islands in the Outer Hebrides have a really distinct natural beauty. The landscape is absolutely spectacular, and the light is very special. But the island life itself can be very isolating. The weather can be harsh and the lifestyle challenging. In order to survive and to thrive in such a community, the community itself becomes a lifeline. So this is a story of a very unique textile community in the Outer Hebrides who produce a very unique cloth called Harris Tweed. The history of Harris Tweed dates back before the 1800s. The Outer Hebrides were predominantly crofters, um, but they were also known for their excellent weaving skills. The long days were spent uh, crofting on their farms, but at night you could hear the clicky clack of the looms throughout the land. The islanders only traded the clomar, the cloth, to themselves, and it was unknown on the mainland up to this point. The twill fabric that they produced, which was later mistakenly called tweed, that's another story. <laughs> um, it was very high quality and it was um, very labor intensive as well. All the stages of production for our suite took place within the Outer Hebrides, and nearly all the weavers were men, with the women only allowed to do the less strenuous tasks, such as yarn winding. But it wasn't until about 1846 that um, the cloth became well known in other parts of the world. Um, Lady Dunmore, Dunmore, sorry, who was the widow of the Earl of Dunmore who was a landowner for much of Harris, was such an admirer of the cloth that she commissioned the Harris Tweed weavers to weave her family's tartan in Harris Tweed. That proved so successful that she became what, in essence, a patron of the cloth. And her, she encouraged her wealthy friends in other places and off the mainland to buy the, the, the fabric. And that really began the Harris Tweed industry as we know it today. Okay. And by the early 1900s, the reputation of the cloth had grown to such an extent that it was being copied and produced elsewhere and marketed as Harris Tweed. So the islanders got together and they wanted to safeguard the reputation of the cloth. So they formed the Harris Tweed Association. <coughs> and this was a way that they could protect the heritage of the cloth and the provenance was saved because they, excuse me, uh, they created a registered or trademark, which they're still using today. By 1911, every meter of cloth that was produced for Harris Tweed that had gone through the very strenuous and rigorous inspection of the Harris Tweed Authority had gotten stamped with the work, and that was done in these wax. In 1934, um, Harris Tweed went through a major production increase because there was an agreement made um, with that, um, excuse me, mill spun yarns could also be used in, as well as uh, hand spun yarns for the production. Um, and by 1966, uh, Harris Tweed had, had reached its peak and it produced uh, over 7 million yards of cloth that year. And that was, um, oh, excuse me, back to there. Okay, and um, that was the peak of production and it produced more than seven million yards of cloth. In, in 1993, there was a major change and that was uh, the Harris Tweed Authority, which now became known from the Harris Tweed Association, had done what no other uh, textile community had done before or has done since, and they created um, an act of parliament to safeguard the provenance of the paper, of the fabric. Okay, and these are all the processes that are involved that have to be done on the Harris Tweed island. But Harris Tweed unfortunately became a victim of its own success because it saturated the market, and um, by 2006, it was in such a steep decline that there were only two mills left in existence producing Harris Tweed in the Outer Hebrides. 
Luckily, in 2007, Harris Street Hebrides itself was born, and this was the founding uh, fathers of Ian Taylor and Brian Wilson, who got together, they had a relationship with um, the Outer Hebrides through personal connections, and they were not going to let this fantastic cloth um, die out. So they formed Harris Street Hebrides, and, sorry, uh, they began a campaign to expand the marketplace. So what they did was they looked to include a younger clientele, they used a fresher color palette um, so that women's wear could be included, they realized how durable the fabric was and therefore it was perfect for the interiors market, um, so they tapped into that quite lucrative market as well, and they worked with some designers on some fashion accessories. Um, so it expanded the market considerably. Okay. Um, Harris Tweed today is thriving and it's still enjoying the resurgence. Um, the mill uh, is working every day with designers um, such as Prada, Alexander McQueen, Chanel, um, Vivian Westwood, Manolo Blahnik. So many of them and they're showing uh, Harris Tweed on the catwalks in every major city throughout the world. Um, luckily, the younger designers absolutely love the quality of the cloth. They love the artisanal her heritage. And they love the fact that each item of Harris Tweed has a label on it which is traceable back to the very craft where it was woven in the Outer Hebrides. So thank goodness it's very important to the consumers. So we mentioned before about how um, how the design houses themselves are not necessarily leading this. I think it's really the customers who are leading this change. So that's where we really have to tap into. Okay, um, so in today, in 2019, Harris Tweed Hebrides is responsible for 90% of production of Harris Tweed. Mm. The mill employs 250 workers. Um, they have managed to train the younger generations so that the skills haven't died out completely and that was just in the nick of time. And most of the mill workers are actually under the age of 40. So, um, and Harris Tweed Hebrides themselves have won several awards for exporting and also for um, the quality of the fabric. They export to 60 countries around the world now and the, Japan, uh, the Japanese market is actually their top market because um, the Japanese absolutely love the artisanship and the heritage and the quality of the cloth. Oh, it's working, yay. <laughs> okay, so the Harris Tweed um, community itself has changed somewhat over the years and also not very much. Um, what has changed is the workforce. It's not predominantly male anymore. Um, the work used to be only five months of the year, um, so it was very seasonal, so a lot of the actual um, workers had to leave the island, and so the island population itself was um, at risk. Um, generations of families would pass skills down to each other, um, but there was always a sense of pride and belonging with the cloth. Um, but Harris Street today is a different story in some respects. Um, the workforce itself, again, is, is younger, there's women. It's a nine to five job, and there's enough work for the weavers and the spinners to live and work more sociable hours um, so they can have a good quality of life. There's a lot of people who are actually attracted to come and live on the island um, because of this. And um, yes, actually I was involved with uh, a workshop where I was training um, Harris Tweed Weavers in Stornway a few years ago and I was really surprised that um, almost everyone were, they were women from England um, and they had come to the island for what they consider to be a better lifestyle. So it's, it's not just um, Aberdeen's anymore. And I was also involved in a fantastic project um, with Creative Futures called The Heritage of Making for the 21st Century. And this was, um, this was a collaboration with Harris Tweed Hebrides and Harry Watt University, and a lot of my colleagues um, were involved with this. It was um, culminated in a book, which I have over here, and um, there were basically interviews from Harris Tweed Hebrides workers um, and various stakeholders and they explained the nostalgia that they felt um, for the product and um, being a part of it and they were saying how um, the community feels ownership and a lot of hands make every meter of cloth 
um, they talked about how um, uncompetitive it was, and I think that was quite remarkable as well. Um, yeah, sense of togetherness, etc. So, I'll sum up now. Um, I think we can look to Harris Tweed and Harris Tweed Hebrides as a great example of sustainability because not only is the wool itself sustainable because it obviously can get regrown by the sheep, um, the carbon footprint is very small because it stays within the Outer Hebrides as it's being made. Um, you'll hear a little bit more about how the waste can be made from John. Um, the cloth is so robust that it doesn't really break down, so it can get passed down from generation to generation. Although, of course, wool is um, but I think the real success story is the way that the textile community has stayed together and worked together. Um, and <coughs> that has kept an economic and a social sustainability within the islands. So, thank you very much. I'd like to introduce Molly Lambert. Molly, where are you? Molly Lambert. Benjamin Bakashi. Graduate from Napier uh, but now in class of Tumal Art Events Management is his thing, but he's looking very carefully tonight for us at how sustainable our talk is. With your permission, I'd ask you to respond to the email. We're going to have a look and see if we're uh, doing a sustainable event. Akshat, I graduated with distinction from Her Perry at University's Master's cor course and tells a beautiful story, and you may have seen her work up in our in stories. And Akshat is looking at the inclusivity of our exhibition. Uh, her uh, area of expertise is visual exhibition for the visually impaired. Ben has been doing an incredible job. We've called his report um, Create, Transport and Install, pleasing all of the people all of the time. <laughs> We've had to divide and archive, work with the venue, uh, work with our transport people, and actually it's been a big learning curve. So Ben's been writing that up for us. Um, and then finally Molly, you'll perhaps see Molly's report upstairs, um, approaching heritage records. The very first journey in design that we speak, in our, speak of in our linen stories is of the Huguenot diaspora from, um, from France, who brought galvanized the weaving industry in Ireland and Scotland. They brought silk, as you'll know, to London, ribbons to Coven Coventry. <coughs> My last visit at Ohio University was very moving. I spoke to one of the technicians who's Syrian. Six years ago, he moved to Turkey. His family are in a war zone. The immigrants from Turkey, from Syria to Turkey, have brought weaving, industrial weaving skills, and now make money for the Turkish government, even then, though they're under a war zone at the moment. He's a very talented man. He's the lead technician at Harriet Watt Weaving Department. And that story of the Huguenots, transfers of technology <coughs> through migration, we are all richer when we reach out to countries and cultures other than our own and when we offer them uh, support here. Well, that's a bit preaching, but you know what I mean? Um, I mean, it's a fact, and it was wonderful to meet Akshata's colleague at Tao University. What will Lynn say to our next speaker? I'd like to introduce John Ferguson. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm going to start off by talking for a couple of minutes about my journey in design. I never actually meant to have a journey in design. Uh, I don't really have anything to do with, or I didn't have anything to do with design. My first degree was in agriculture and then I did a master's in international development. And I spent uh, several years working with small scale farmers in East Africa. Uh, training them on agricultural productivity and on coping with climate change. Uh, after some time, I guess 2013, uh, I wanted to have a bit of a, a change from that. I wanted to start uh, an ethical business uh, trading with small scale farmers in East Africa. Uh, I felt that was, in that way, you could be more on the on the same, on the more on the same level, rather than a kind of donor donor recipient type relationship. So I wanted to start an ethical business, 
And I've started looking at all the different uh, commodities uh, that you could potentially trade. Quickly ruled out foodstuffs uh, because of obviously uh, the distance and uh, air transport. I got really interested in, in sisal. So this year, if you can see it, is a picture of some uh, sisal plants growing in, in East Africa, in Tanzania. And this is an extremely uh, sustainable fibre crop with a very low water use. Um, these plants are probably 30 years old and uh, they've outlived many droughts which have killed lots of maize and beans and other plants. I'll not turn this into an agronomy lecture. I'll really try not to turn this into an agronomy lecture. But basically, the leaves contain this extremely strong and extremely sustainable fibre called sisal fibre. So basically the length of fibre is the same length as the uh, leaves and they're simply uh, cut by hand using a, using a knife and uh, then the fibre is extracted uh, from the leaves um, just using a really simple machine uh, which basically just scrapes off the, the leaf sheet and you have the, the green size of fibre which you then uh, just hang up to dry uh, and then you basically have the fibre um, that you can work with and traditionally that has been either made into ropes or spun into, uh, spun into a cloth such as this uh, which is used for making coffee sacks so back at the beginning we wanted to start with a, a really simple product or kind of minimum viable product that didn't require much uh, investment so we used this, this cloth which is normally used um, for making coffee sacks to make uh, geotextiles so these are basically um, fabrics for, for use in the ground and these were exported, these were made in East Africa and exported here to the UK so um, if you can imagine for example, this is a, a sand dune and the waves come in, undercut the sand dunes, causing them to collapse. Normally, um, if somebody wanted to do this kind of work, they would use a plastic-based geotextile. You end up with plastic in the water stream. Uh, ditto for riverbank stabilisation. Quite often you put a, a plastic-based fabric over that to stabilise it. We were using uh, sisal, which is biodegradable over about three years. Um, we kind of accidentally got into this whole... Uh, business of peatland restoration. I don't know how much people know about peat, but basically a lot of Scotland is covered in peat. If it's dry, it emits CO2. If it's wet, it absorbs CO2. So you want to find ways of, of damming up uh, these kind of damaged areas. Uh, traditionally, plastic is used. Uh, so we started using our sisal uh, geotextiles for that. So you could quickly and easily fill it with peat, uh, make a little dam, and, and pretty quickly the whole area was uh, a nice wet and uh, carbon sink again. That's kind of an intro. So, moving through time, uh, we got to around 2015, 2016, and decided, <coughs> right, you know, this has been an interesting start. We've got our minimum viable product, but it's really pretty niche. We want to go back to the drawing board and, and see what kind of mass market product we can develop. So, I did a whole bunch of uh, university research projects. One of them was actually literally in the next street at Edinburgh University Architecture Department. Um, and they wanted to, they started off doing things with uh, concrete, as it so happens, uh, using the same troops that you just saw pouring concrete into it to form it, uh, to form it in that way. Um, but um, one thing that I really wanted them to experiment with was about the thermal properties of sisal and whether it could be used. Uh, as a sustainable building product, and particularly uh, an insulation product. Um, and to cut a long story short, it can be. Um, so I developed a, a brand, um, Sizal Tech. It's quite interesting, I'm going to look at my notebook a bit, because some of the things that we, that we spoke about tonight, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of coming back to. Lynn mentioned about the sustainable development goals. I went to a, a building show in London called EcoBuild back in 2017 and they were uh, pushing the whole concept of how can, um, how can startup businesses in the construction sector contribute to the sustainable development goals. So there and then we kind of signed up and said yeah, what we do is going gonna, is gonna to contribute to that. Um, Yeah, so, so just one slide on why insulate, why bother insulating, and I don't know if anybody saw this in the metro just a couple of weeks ago, but it is 
energy, and energy efficiency is kind of the, the missing part in the jigsaw puzzle. You know, everybody's been busy thinking about uh, renewable energy, which is, which is great. We're kind of just about, maybe Robin will correct me, we're kind of just about there. We're busy thinking about electric cars, that's great. And the last kind of part of the puzzle is, is, is Scotland's housing stock. Um, and there's been a bit of talk about you know, moving away from burning gas to, to, to using electricity, but it's kind of, whatever fuel you're using, it's kind of pointless if the heat's coming out of the roof. So basically, we need, we need to insulate in some kind of way. And uh, John asked me not to use any bullet points. I've only got one slide of bullet points, because uh, it would take too long to make the pictures. Anyway, why not just use mainstream insulation products? What's, what's the matter with them? Well, there are a few uh, pretty significant things. One is their most insulation products are really energy intensive to manufacture. So if you take the market leader Kingspan, produce one kilo of Kingspan, I'm probably not allowed to use mm -hmm. names, to anyway, to produce one kilo of Kingspan, it emits about eight kilos of CO2 equivalent, uh, whereas our product is less than one kilo. Um, I had come at this thinking about it from a carbon point of view and an ethical point of view, but in fact lots of our potential customers that I've spoken to, they're actually much more interested in the health issues. As we move towards more airtight buildings, particularly passive house standard, people are becoming really concerned about off-gassing, i.e. does the stuff in your house emit VOCs? Um, so there's a really good argument there for having a uh, natural, uh, natural product. Uh, Off-cuts, this uh, picture here, I also took in this uh, street actually, it's got a skip full of uh, fiberglass. And no matter how good you are insulating, you always end up with a load of off-cuts. Uh, and it normally takes between 200 and 400 years to decompose and landfill, um, which is not really sustainable. Uh, a fire, I don't even know if we'll go into that, it's like a really uh, large and, and, and complex issue, but as was touched on earlier, there are really um, some serious issues about the gases given off uh, if a plastic-based uh, insulation burns. Um, let me go back to my notes for a second. So, yeah, of all the insulation in the market at the moment, less than 1% of it is uh, sustainable. Um, there are some other products out there. There's sheep's wool products, there's wood fibre products, hemp-based products. Um, but we reckoned that there was, there was room in the market for one more. So we started this uh, slightly ridiculous task of trying to figure out how to make our sizable fibre from the plants that you saw into uh, insulation. So... Um, you saw a minute ago the, uh, the fibre hanging up on the, on the washing line <coughs> in San Diego. So it's been then put into bales as there, as it is there, with nothing else done to it. Then brought over here, and, and so obviously in the densest form, you don't want to be filling a shipping container with light and fluffy stuff. It uh, goes in a dense form and then it's made into insulation here. So that's it, um, that's it simply chopped up. Uh, we then had to figure out, yeah, how, the, okay. We had to figure out how, what technology to use. There are several different technologies out there that you could use. You could use a kind of paper making process, but this is using a, a process called air lake, where basically you use high pressure air to blow it into the shape that you want. Um, and it took quite a lot of trial and error. There were quite a few errors there before getting to the, to the kind of thing that we might want. Uh, but eventually, a um, pile of satisfactory insulation. And um, we started off. Um, making just pure sizal insulation. Uh, then we find out from Lynn and others about the whole circular economy thing. So in this case, uh, the sizal was made into coffee sacks in Tanzania and used to bring coffee beans to Scotland, which were then roasted and put into little bags that you buy coffee in. Uh, and then the sacks were then shredded and then used to make into the insulation. So it had some other uses along the way. Um, for John, we have a 50-50 sizal and cottonized flax uh, sample. And because of the topic tonight, we also have a 50% recycled Harris tweet, 50% sizal sample here. And the, the kind of, we started off only wanting to use sizal, but then we're like, we can do so much with the circular economy stuff. The sizal is really strong and it gives the the uh, insulation its, its structure, uh, but you can get all kinds of interesting uh, qualities in terms of the kind of squeezability, if you like, uh, and warmth by, by blending with other fibres as well. This one, it's not 
so relevant tonight, but shredded blue jeans uh, combined with size them. So uh, we kind of thought, you know, we started off just wanting to do size oscillation, but we thought there's so many other waste streams out there, uh, and we can do so many cool things with it. Why don't we just actually try and make the best insulation that there is? Um, in addition to that, if you've seen other natural fibre insulations, oh, I missed out the photos, too busy talking. That's uh, some shredded Harris tweet. Uh, that's it, uh, being cottonized or being kind of opened up anyway, combined with the sizal to make uh, to make this, and that's that sample there. Um, that was our first uh, that was our first build. It was a, a garage in Denny that we uh, that we put our insulation into for a little trial. Um, where was I? Yeah, if you've seen any other natural uh, fibre insulations, they have one slight Achilles heel which is, uh, they're all held together with a plastic-based binder. Um, usually 15 or 20% of the product is a plastic-based binder. And we've spent basically the last year trying to figure out how not to have that. So these all have a, a starch-based, a byproduct starch-based binder holding them together. And when we go to the market, um, hopefully at the start of next year, uh, we will be uh, the first plastic-free insulation. Whoa. How long have I got? Probably about it. Hey. <laughs> Thank you. you heard it here first. That is fantastic. Shares available. Uh, been wonderful. Uh, so water and power, those key things that we think about when we think about a product and manufacture and after use and all the rest of it. This is amazing. And you know, let's shred up the blue jeans because it, I just this is a polluter otherwise. I mean it's it's extraordinary to, to be to have a valuable product. Incredible that we have been using plastics to support coasts. What an extraordinary and difficult thing to hear. Geotextiles with a biodegradable size. Well, amazing, amazing uh, production. Okay, so we've got our opportunity now uh, to do a little Q&A. I'm going to take first go at that. Uh, before I do that, I just want to sort of thank and acknowledge a couple of other folk. Um, Nurturing design talent was something we, we touched on. We look at that in one of our panels upstairs, but writers, historians, photographers, journalists, they all nurture design talent in their own ways. I'd like to thank Abed Nazir and Maxine Ragney for their photography on our living stories. <laughs> If you get a chance, uh, Abbott puts together our photo montages from, from Max's, and we've got a lot of this one on our Coracle project. Um, Vanessa Habib is here, a textile historian. Vanessa, thank you for your support in the project. <laughs> Journalism plays an incredibly important part getting the message out. I'd like to say thank you for coming to Stacey Hunter, who writes regularly for the skinning. Stacey. Any burning questions from the audience first? We have one here. Stacey. Um, I just want to say, uh, John, so the obviously the starting at the, at the top end. Um, I guess we've kind of made different kind of segments of customers. So our kind of initial customers are kind of people who are, who are building their own eco houses, who are doing retrofit and architects who are interested in really uh, you know green projects. That's going to be our starting point. Um, after that we're going to kind of move to to house builders who are trying to reduce their carbon footprint, maybe kind of meet, meet Briam standards and stuff like that. And then eventually we'll be kind of on the mass market. And we're kind of hoping that by the time we're, we're there, our kind of production efficiencies will have gone up and the price will come down. But now we're kind of, uh, kind of starting with the top. But not that expensive, about 16 pounds per meter. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little note there about uh, government uh, and in particular industry standards. I was at a, a thing called ISPO in Munich, the biggest uh, 
outdoor apparel and kit fair, um, thanks Dom, and instantly I met Gila from Ben Rothis at that same um, fair. Uh, I also counted 42 different symbols suggesting companies were eco-friendly. There just didn't seem to be any standardization in how one acknowledges it, uh, as a consumer that there might be something green or otherwise about a product. I did partly ingest, suggest a, a wounded planet as a marker if you don't have a good product. Then any thought, oh, we're going to it. Uh, in 1688, Scotland put on statute to support the linen industry that you had to be buried in linen, stamped with Scottish linen. It's a bit of government support for a textile. Uh, linen, thoughts on, on that standardisation? So I think as consumers, we get a pretty dumb deal because who can read your labelling? I mean, it's tiny, it doesn't mean anything, and it needs a complete overhaul. And um, I'm becoming part of the British Standards Institute consumer panels for looking at standards and looking to address standards um, because we really need to overhaul what it is that we want consumers to know. But equally, going back to design, it's about transparency in the design process and how much, how far are you willing to go as a designer to share your production, to share what's in your fibre, to share where it's been manufactured. So how are you going to integrate that in your story? And how much do you want to? And we're seeing that at the moment. We're seeing uh, big international brands like Everlane, uh, clothing, uh, slow clothing brand in the US, they will pre present on their website exactly where the factory is that manufactures the clothing, how many people are in that factory, what gender are they, to give us that authenticity, that traceability in the supply chain. And Scotland, for me, wants to be good at this. But we need to be better. Just tagging sustainability onto things. When we know the whole supply chain, when we know the process that we've gone through, um, it's about sharing that story. So that when that product gets to the end of the, the other end of the world, that that person thinks about it because we can't guarantee that a stunning Harris Tweed makeup bag is going to be loved by the person at the other end of the world and that they don't just put it in the bin. So the more we can do to persuade someone that there is a story to this product and if it's not for you, pass it on, uh, then it is about the balance of the standards, the labelling and the story. So just, I know I'm rambling on here, but very yeah. quickly to give you an example of the complexity of organic cotton. So we're all encouraged to buy organic cotton, but if you're a cotton uh, farmer in India and you're not an organic cotton farmer and you're being pushed to manufacture it, uh, to grow organic cotton and you can't afford it, you might end up out of business. So we have two standards there. We have the British Cotton Initiative which uh, you will see on your John Lewis underwear, BCI. That means that the farmers there are working towards more sustainable practices in growing that cotton. They're reducing their chemical uh, processing in the fibre because it's very expensive to suddenly go from being a cotton farmer to an organic farmer. If it's got a GOT standard, then it's a completely organic cotton fibre product. But again, these are industry standards. It's as consumers, what are we looking out for? And we need more help with that. And those standards need to be more explicit. The brands using them need to be more explicit and help us with these stories. Mm -hmm. So it's really about looking at standards as transparency and storytelling. Mm -hmm. I love that. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of, I should be at every point an ethical consumer. At the point of purchase, is the colour right? Is the fit right? How far forward is the question about, you know, is it sustainably produced? Is it going to have an afterlife? What's, what's happening? It, it is tricky as a, as a consumer. John? Can I, can I make two really quick comments? One, um, is this on? Um, I really naively thought at the, at the beginning of my whole journey, people would buy stuff because it's ethical and sustainable. People won't. People, most people, 90% of the population, 
will buy what they want, depending on what they need and the price of it. And if there are two that are pretty similar, one happens to be you know, a bit more ethical or a bit more sustainable, they'll go for that one. Um, and uh, so, you know, as this kind of business, as an ethical business, you actually really need to have a technically better product than everything else on the market. And it's just kind of inside a little happy thing that you're doing it, that you're making a more sustainable product. Um, that was that was one point. I just wanted to answer the question quickly as well, because I think there's loads of, of greenwashing. Mm. You know, if you go in the, you know, Glenn, you spoke obviously about the, the kind of uh, clothes and fashion, and, you know, if you look at the building industry as well, if you walk right around some of the trade shows, everybody's called eco something, eco yeah, this. And, um, you know, I've been somewhere, I've kind of tucked my badge away and just gone up naively and said, you know, oh, you're making everything out of polystyrene. How come, how come you're called eco whatever mm -hmm. construction? And they're like, oh, it's just an A, you know, it's what people want to hear. You know, it's that, it's that blatant. So something really does need to be done, for sure. Um, a Trumpian view of marketing there doesn't really matter if you're telling any truth whatsoever. Uh, so, Oh, a couple of things occurred to me there. The, the notion of labelling, how we go about it. And this business of greenwashing, a bit of a plug for our, uh, our uh, Making Well Summer Exhibition next year. It's called Salvage the Circular Economy at Sea. And we've got just a, a taster um, a taster display at the back. That print, that chair, is made by a company called Emuco, who make a chair called the Navy Chair. It was made from recycled aluminium initially for the troops, battleship submarines from the state. And, well, they went into a collaboration with Coca-Cola who wanted to maintain or up their uh, green credentials. And that's made of 111 recycled Coca-Cola plastic bottles. So it's called the, uh, the 111, the 111 uh, chair. Next to it, and this is where we're getting into our exhibition, is a wonderful um, Cuban graphic designer who's produced that silk screen print. It's the Coca Cola wave and bottle floating in the ocean. It's a graphic design noting that Coca Cola is the most polluting plastic producer in the world three times more so than the next plastic polluter. So we have a long way to go to understand labelling and to help us interpret when someone claims some, eco uh, some ecological um, perspective. Questions from the floor? John, can I just do a quick plug? Well, I'm sorry, Very good. Point. Sorry, I should have said that, my, uh, that if you are a really confused consumer, the best place is the ethical consumer. The PhD is funded by the ESRC and sponsored collaboration with the ethical consumer and it's completely data driven and they research every brand that they can and they make comparisons mm. on their sustainability credentials, on their uh, modern day slavery, on their human rights and it is a really, there is a lot of emotion out there and there are a lot of sites doing this kind of thing but they're 30 years old, they are the original ethical Great, thank you. Thanks very much. I'm just going to jump down to Jenny there, who's at the back. Um, this question is actually for John, and also I forgot the press lady speaking a few minutes ago. Um, in actual fact, uh, I was aware too when I was travelling in Canada. In actual fact, a lot of the companies out there are actually using their waste from producing materials, and they actually break it down for for example, insulation or for various other products. However, here in Scotland, we have an extremely agricultural country based mainly on sheep. Now, you've talked about breaking down Harris Tweed. Why aren't you using our wool? This would actually help the farmers in, in, in a lot of places, and I think this is something that really should be used for insulation. Thanks. Well, actually, I'm going to do a quick plug on that basis for the architecture and design Scotland materials library. Hey, Lynn, would you like to speak to that? Lynn has just taken on a uh, role with architecture and design. <laughs> <laughs> the, the materials library. Well, the materials library, yes, uh, architecture. But there are rules. Architecture and design Scotland does have some. Uh, it does have a materials library in the lighthouse. 
Uh, we are growing it to have a digital bank of um, recycled materials and resources, but it does have some natural wool insulation fibres in there. But the issue of wool in Scotland is a really challenging one. And it all goes back to the British Wool Marketing Board. And it's not as simple as just uh, rearing sheep in Scotland. And I'm sure the lady at the back knows that. I'm sure you're familiar with the issues around the British Wool Marketing Board and the price of fleece and how difficult it is for farmers to sell the fleece to the British Wool Marketing Board. And it has to go through that process in order to become part of the market share. And so that is a whole discussion for another day, but it is the ideal, but I think, and I don't know, perhaps, Marnie, you can uh, clarify this, but when I went to Harris in 2016, uh, only 5% of the fibre was Scottish and 95% is British wool from the British Wool Marketing Board. Because I know that the Japanese come and they think they're going to um, give the sheep a hug that the fiber came from, and that's not the case. I don't, I don't believe it goes back that far. It's still in effect. Um, but they are trying to breed new sheep that are having softer faces. That's happening all throughout Scotland, so hopefully we'll get there soon. Great. John, yeah. Yeah, I'd just like to respond to the lady's question. Um, yeah, I, when I was younger, I spent I think four or five Easter's uh, lambing lambing sheep. So, uh, so you know that was straight away. You know that was that was one of my ideas. Um, um, it's really actually hard to to buy Scottish wool from hillbred sheep. You know, you want to you, the kind of wool you want to use for this is is off uh, Scottish black faces basically, or or Swaledale or other like upland uh, hard bit. I know that's in England. But you know, basically, the mountain breeds have basically warmer wool. But to try and to try and just buy one particular batch of wool is really difficult. It tends all to be muddled up. It tends to also have, uh, you know, at least ten, if not twenty percent of synthetic fibres uh, blended in by the time you know it's it's some of the you know, places where you can buy these kind of fibres from. So I would like to, uh, and we have actually done uh, some trials with making. Uh, some, but the wool is not from Scotland, but if I can locate some, if you would like some insulation made with Scottish wool, <laughs> yeah, we'll try and find some. Thanks, John. Questions? No question. Any questions? I got so many. Um, I'm going to reflect on the living fact. Uh, England didn't want uh, any threat to its woolen industry. So in the 18th century, we got, uh, sorry, they didn't want a uh, threat to the wool industry, so we got preferential treatment to develop our linen, as did Ireland. Um, there are many other linen facts. Listen, it's been fantastically engaged. I'd like, if you would, uh, join me to thank our fantastic panel speakers. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>